If I had known there was going to be an ice storm, my wife June and I wouldn't have gone to the theater to see a play that night. The storm wasn't forecast. The weather was supposed to be a drizzle of rain at worst. But out of nowhere, a massive ice storm descended upon us. We were just five minutes from home when the accident occurred. I drove slow and carefully. The driver in the oncoming lane did not. He lost control of his vehicle, slid over into our lane, and hit us head on. June was killed instantly. I suffered head trauma and was in the hospital for a few days. On my way home from the hospital, I noticed that the world seemed different. It was darker. Initially, I assumed I was viewing the world in a different way, as if it was simply less bright without my June in it. We had been married for almost 50 years. This was going to be a big adjustment for me. My dog Shep was mighty happy to see me when I got home. One of my neighbors made sure he had food and water while I was gone, but Shep was never happy unless he was with me or June. I guess he was going to have to be satisfied with just me from now on. I put a leash on Shep and took him for a walk. Boy, the neighborhood sure looked strange. Portions of the neighborhood were covered in shadows, even though there wasn't a cloud in the sky and there was nothing around to create such shadows. The shadows weren't everywhere, just over certain houses. I live just a few blocks from the old town square. There's a small river down there that I like to take Shep to. He enjoys wading in the water while he laps it up. The town was covered in the odd shadows as well. Not all of it, though. It was so bizarre. It was as though a shadow had been cast over certain specific things. It was bright and sunny, but some buildings were darkened in shadows while buildings just next door were bathing in sunlight. This was the same case for people, too. I could see two people walking side by side on the sun-drenched sidewalk. One would be glowing with sunlight while the other was enveloped by a shadow as though they had an invisible storm cloud hovering over them. Day after day it was the same thing. Half of the world was in a shadow, and there was no rhyme or reason for it. I told my doctor about it. He was concerned that I was having a setback of some sort. He ordered all kinds of MRIs, X-rays, brain scans, and eye exams. But everything appeared normal. He didn't have an explanation. He could only theorize that my head was still healing, and this was a side effect he was confident would gradually improve with time. Three months later, nothing had improved. The shadows were more pronounced than ever, and I realized they weren't just over buildings and people. They were over other objects as well, such as cars, buses, airplanes, and the shadows weren't unique to just humans. Every day I was seeing dogs, cats, birds, squirrels with gloomy shadows over them. Eventually, I began to figure things out. One day, I saw a shadowed woman walk into a bright building, and within seconds, the entire building was cast in a shadow. I stood and watched. I waited for the woman to leave. The second she exited the building, it lit up again. I saw a man walking his shadowed dog down the street. When they both got into a car, the car became shadowed. At that point, I knew that any time I saw a building, house, or vehicle that was cast in an artificial shadow, a shadowed person or animal was within it. My next question was, why? Why did some of these people and animals have constant shadows? Were they different than the rest of us somehow? I talked to several people who were cast in a shadow. They seemed normal. They didn't behave any different than the rest of us, but 
the shadow had to mean something, didn't it? As I grew more accustomed to the shadow world, I noticed that the shadows were of varying shades. Some were faint shadows, while others were extreme. I was keeping my eye on a house across the street from mine. It was cast in the darkest shadow I had ever seen. Mr. and Mrs. O'Brien lived there. They were both in their 90s. They made an old man like me look young. They were both heavily shadowed, especially Mrs. O'Brien. That evening I saw something I had never seen before. It was a dark silhouette standing in Mr. and Mrs. O'Brien's yard. It was a black figure, an actual shadow in the shape of a person. I watched as it stood in front of the O'Brien's house for several minutes. I was surprised when Mrs. O'Brien exited the house and walked up to the shadow figure. Mrs. O'Brien had been confined to a wheelchair for over a decade. Yet there she was, walking with no ailments visible. She walked fearlessly to the shadow figure, embraced it, and disappeared. What had I just witnessed? I had no time to think about it as the shadowy figure in the O'Brien's yard twisted around in my direction. It was void of life, pure black, and it was looking my way. I quickly ducked down behind my porch rails to keep out of its view. A few moments later, I ever so slightly peered out from my cover, and the shadowy figure was gone. What was that thing? Later that night, an ambulance arrived at the O'Brien's house and transported her body away. It all began to make sense. I looked around and realized that a lot of the people who were holding shadows were older. Not as many young people had them. The same went for animals as well. Puppies and kittens rarely had shadows. Older critters often did. The shadows were a sign of looming death. The darker the shadow, the closer one was to the end. I found myself taking Shep to walk around the outskirts of hospitals. Hospitals were always cast in a shadow, and I'd often see those creepy shadow figures waiting outside. I felt like a voyeur. I wasn't comfortable seeing all of this, but I felt drawn to it, like a moth to a flame. I was sitting near the hospital one day on a park bench giving Shep a breather. I noticed one of those creepy shadow figures standing near the hospital entrance. Those things scared me. I felt like I should run from them, but at the same time, I had to watch. Suddenly, the creepy shadow figure turned and faced me, as if it had sensed me watching it. It was nothing but blackness in a human shape. There were no shades to them, or wrinkles like one might expect to see with clothing. This was just a pure shadow. In an instant, the shadow figure zoomed toward me at lightning speed. I gasped when it stopped in front of me. It had no eyes, but I could feel it staring at me. It had no mouth, but it spoke to me. Its voice reverberated as though it were inside of an endless cavern. You can see me, can't you? I stuttered a bit before I finally formed a sentence. <laughs> are, you, are you talking to me? You can see me. Are you here for me? It's not your time yet. Fear not, June is waiting for you. I could feel my eyes welling with tears and my lower lip begin to quiver. Can you... can you take me to June? Yes, I can. But if I did that, who would take care of Shep? The shadow figure was correct. 
I couldn't leave my old Shep alone in the world. I was going to acknowledge as much, but the shadow figure spoke before I could. You aren't supposed to be able to see me. With that, the shadow figure raced toward me and my world went black. I woke up on the bench with a woman in nursing scrubs holding my face and speaking firmly to me. Sir, can you hear me? Are you okay? I rubbed my dry eyes and cleared my throat. Yes, young lady, I'm just fine. She gave me a smile and walked back into the hospital. I looked down at Shep. I guess it's time for us to go home. As we walked away, I looked back at the hospital that was basked in sunlight. It felt different to me. I'm not sure why. There's a lot about the past few months that I can't quite remember. Logic would tell me it has something to do with the head injury I sustained in the car crash, but I know there's something else to it. This might sound crazy, but it's almost as if there was something I once knew, but I don't anymore, because I wasn't supposed to.